In the book of Genesis to chapter 12, chapter 12, uh, we, this will be our third time in the book of Genesis. I've been kind of excited about it. First, we, we looked at uh, the first eight or nine verses, and then last week we looked at verse 10. Tonight we are going to be looking at verses 11 through 20, except we will begin reading in verse 10 where Moses writes this, Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a time, because the famine was severe in the land. It came about when he was approaching Egypt that he said to his wife Sarai, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but let you live. Please say that you are my sister, so that it may go well for me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. Verse 14. Now it came about when Abram entered Egypt that the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her. To Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Therefore, he treated Abram well for her sake. And he gave him sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for myself as a wife? Now then here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belong to him. You may be seated. In the first eight or nine verses of Genesis 12, we watched Abram take a giant step forward with the Lord. In the remaining part of chapter 12, we are sort of surprised to see Abram take a giant step backward with the Lord. In fact, we actually see him take six giant steps backward. Well, what are those steps? Here's Abram's first step backward. It is the step of unbelief. Now, so far as earthly circumstances went, the decision of Abram uh, was a wise decision. I mean, after all, look, there was a famine. Abram could have expected no food from the Canaanites. They were in the same fix as was Abram. And even if they had not been, he could hardly have expected the Canaanites to assist a stranger. So what else was he to do? To be sure, there were ample circumstances to justify Abram's course of action. But if that action evidenced a failure of belief in God, as it certainly did, then the unbelief was still unbelief. And the Bible tells us that no one can please God who does not trust Him. The writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please him, for the one who comes to God must believe that he exists. The 1995 NASB says, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him, that he proves to be the one who rewards those who seek him, believing that God is and believing that God is a rewarder. 
Are we not then to see the circumstances that surround us? I, I think that we are. We are to see the circumstances, or as some people might say, we are to be realists. But I want you to know that it is no step in spiritual growth to be blind to what reality may be. However, our, difficult, our difficulty is not that we see the circumstances. Those are often easy to see but rather that we fail to see the entire picture. That is, that we fail to include not only our earthly circumstances, whatever they may be, but that we fail to see the God who is the God of circumstances. Don't forget about God. Well, most of you here tonight are familiar with Peter's trouble when he set out on the Sea of Galilee to walk to Jesus. Was it merely that he saw the sea and knew that it was dangerous? No, look, he knew before he ever went over the side of that boat that the sea was dangerous. And yet he went anyway and did very well at the beginning. So when did his problem arise? You know when. Well, what does it say? Yeah, he, he took his eyes off Jesus. And when he took his eyes off Jesus and he settled and focused on his circumstances of the sea, he became afraid and he began to sink. You, you've heard that old uh, story about uh, the Christian who asked someone how he was doing. And uh, he replied, well, under the circumstances, I, I'm doing all right. And then came the second question, well, what are you doing under the circumstances? You know, I sort of like to use uh, uh, some surfing terms here. Believers are to ride on top of the wave as opposed to riding under the wave. So Abram's first step backward was a step of unbelief. It was a step of distrust, which I think leads to his second step backward, which is the failure to worship. You will remember that in the first nine verses of this chapter, Abram built two altars when he arrived in Canaan. One of those altars he built in Shechem. The other altar he built just east of Bethel. And he worshipped in both places. However, there is no record of Abram building an altar and worshiping again until after his expulsion from Egypt. And of course, this is common to those who cease trusting God. It is very difficult to worship God when he is not trusted. It takes great trust to worship God and worship Him confidently. In fact, distrust, or if you want to use the term faithlessness, or if you want to use the term unbelief, did you know that is sin? And what sin does is to keep us from experiencing the very power of God. You know, it doesn't, uh, or, or rather it happens not uncommonly that maybe a young man or a young woman strong in their Christian faith goes off to college, falls into a life of self or sin, and pretty soon that young person uh, stops reading the Bible. Then that young person stops praying. That young person stops worshiping with other believers. And because that young person cannot endure the inconsistency in life, he, he cannot live with his profession up and his practice down. And since he's not willing to give up the sin or not willing to give up self so that both the profession and the practice are up, he brings the profession down to the level of the practice. And he begins to discount Christianity. You know, a person doesn't get there all at once. 
we stop trusting God or casting great doubt on God, either his existence or his involvement in our lives. And then the next thing you know, we stop worshiping God. And sometimes, sometimes these folks will say, you know, Christianity is just a, a lot of hypocrisy. I believe in God, but I, I don't have to go to church with a bunch of self-righteous people to listen to sermons on what I should be doing or shouldn't be doing. I, I'm just going to stay at home. I can get as much out of my relationship with God at home, isolated here by myself, as I ever could down at that church with, with those bunch of hypocrites. Well, eventually... That person's spiritual life withers. Now, I know that there are people who sometimes get into circumstances uh, because of which they are unable to worship. And, and thus they have to do other things to try to fill in that gap uh, by worshiping. But I have never known an excited, enthusiastic champion for God who was not involved in corporate worship. Have you? Can you think of a single person who never comes together with the people of God and that person is excited and enthusiastic and confident in their relationship with the Lord? Now here's what I've discovered. The more a person exercises trust in the middle of difficulty, the more that person wants to worship the Lord. In fact, I think the vitality of a person's Christianity can be seen in a person's habit of worship. And I might suggest to you tonight that the most powerful times of worship come to us when we are in the middle of some great difficulty. Let me ask you, how many of you have ever gone through great difficulty? Anybody? Are, are you sure? I, mean, I know we got more than that, right? Yeah, yeah, you've gone through times of great difficulty. If you can remember back to those times, remember if you sort of lost your footing and you sort of stumbled along the way and just said, you know, if this is as good as God can do, I'm just going to stop worshiping God. Well, look, how did that work out for you? Well, apparently not too well because you're back, right? Yeah, you're back. Saying, hey, that's, that doesn't work out for me. And I would suggest that the greater the difficulty, the greater the desire to worship the Lord. Now, going to church is not a guarantee of a person's relationship to Christ. But being actively involved in a strong Bible teaching church is certainly evidence of Christian vitality. Someone has set forth the following questions. Does worship seem like a chore? Does worship does attending worship seem to date take great effort? Is the end of worship of greater concern than the beginning of worship or the middle of worship? Now, now, you know, how can you tell if which part of the worship experience is the most important to you? How can you tell if it's the beginning, the middle, or the end? How can you tell? Get, just throw something out there. How about how often you look at your watch? I, I don't mean how often you snooze and go to sleep. You know, I don't know that that counts. Boy, that was quick. But rather, when we are caught up in the worship experience, time is just not a factor. Time is not something that is of a concern to us. You know, especially in my early years, I, I would have people say, well, you kept us, you kept us over time today, didn't you, preacher? Well, well what is over time? Well, past 12 o'clock, right? Yeah, past 12 o'clock. What I really discovered is they were just mad because the Methodists got to the lunch places before they did. So we just sort of adjusted the starting time. 
so they can get out earlier. Well, well, let's ask these questions. Do you long to engage in the worship of God in the company of other believers? Are you possessed by an anxiousness to meet with believers? Now, if the answer to those last two questions is yes, that may be genuine evidence that you are trusting God regardless of the situation and that you are being blessed as you journey on with him. So here's Abram's third step back. It is the step of self-confidence. So one step removed from distrusting God is failure to worship God. And then one step removed from that is confidence in self. And of course, this, that has to be the way it is. Because this person who is not trusting God, who is not worshiping God, this person begins then to discount the very wisdom of God as that wisdom is found in Scripture. And instead begins to substitute a wisdom and a confidence of his or her own. This is exactly what Abram did. There's a famine in the land. Well, I don't know that that was particularly uncommon in those days. I don't know that it's ever been un- uncommon if you look the world over. But Abram looked at the famine and he determined to leave Canaan for Egypt because of the famine. No sooner had he made this decision that he was faced with the dangers that were going to meet him in Egypt. Now, Sarai was a beautiful woman. You know, I I don't think Abram had no ugly truck and he didn't have no ugly woman. He had a good-looking wife. And he knew she was good-looking. Listen, it's sort of like my wife. I knew she was a looker when I got her. I knew I married up. You know, I, I told you when I first came here, somebody said, why did you marry Donna, meet and marry Donna in six weeks? And I said, because she was hot. <laughs> Sarai was a looker. Abram knew that. And let me tell you something. Abram lived in a dangerous world. The Canaanites were dangerous and the Egyptians were also dangerous. Abram was headed down into Egypt by his own wisdom. And as he thought about it on the way to Egypt, he became afraid that some Egyptian would kill him in order to take her either to be his wife or one of his concubines. So what was he to do? Could he trust God for protection in Egypt. You know what the answer is to that? No. Why? Because he had already abandoned his trust in God to help him in the far lesser matter of the famine. So he had to fall back on his own devices. If we cannot trust God in a lesser circumstance, we will never trust God in a greater circumstance. And, and in fact, one just leads to the other. You, you know, I, I, I think when it, comes, when it comes to church, church ministry, when it comes to church administration, I, I think that it is imperative to make good decisions. You know why? Because good decisions beget good decisions. Have you ever known that? And there are a lot of churches that make bad decisions and then another bad decision follows that and another bad decision follows that and another bad decision follows that. Well, it's it's the same way in our relationship with God. We begin to express a disbelief in God and, and pretty soon we are not trusting God for anything. 
But the more we trust God, the more we see that we can trust God. So Abram's on his way to Egypt, and in Egypt there was absolutely no uh, way he could trust God for his protection there. He had already abandoned that in Canaan. So he fell back on his own devices. Now let's check out verses 11, 12, and 13 to see how Abram reasoned with his wife. When he was approaching Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. They'll kill me. They'll let you live. Please say that you are my sister, so that it will go well for me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. Now, now, was this all about Sarah or was this all about Abram? Sarai or Abram? I, I mean, who, who was this great? I mean, I'm sure that he didn't want anything to happen to Sarai. But he is thinking about his own backside. He, he's thinking about himself. Now, Abram probably would not even have thought he was lying since according to verses 11 and 12 in Genesis 20, Sarai actually was his half-sister. Besides, he certainly meant well, and everybody knows that if you mean well, that's the most important thing. See, I really think that Abram expected the Egyptians to enter into some kind of negotiation for Sarai. And he thought that he could drag the negotiations out until the famine was over. But still, being less than honest is still being what? Less than honest. You know, whenever we want to do something wrong, we can always find a good reason for doing it. If we can't think of a good reason ourselves, then the devil, of course, will supply us with a good reason. That is why the wisdom writer wrote in Proverbs chapter 3, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. All right, now here's Abram's fourth step back. It is the step of multiplying sin. So first, Abram stumbles twice in trusting God, once in the famine, and then his dilemma with the beauty of his wife. He adds to that by convincing Sarai to lie also, thus compounding his distrust by involving an increasing number of individuals in his plan. Even Pharaoh is almost involved. In fact, the Pharaoh would have committed adultery with Sarai, though innocently, thinking her to be Abram's sister rather than his wife. Had God not preserved Sarai's honor, that is exactly what would have happened. And I can say, generally speaking, I think this is how self-dependence work. works. It adds to itself like a snowball going downhill. A person never distrusts God just a little bit for the simple reason that distrust begins to infect everything else and every one else. Do, do you see how this just balloons? And the next thing you know, it has encompassed everything about Abram's life and everything about the life of his wife, and including the Pharaoh's life. Here's Abram's fifth step back. It is the step of great loss. Abram had absolutely no idea what was going to happen to him in Egypt, but no sooner was he there than he found his scheme to be inadequate. 
He thought that Sarai would be under his protection while he negotiated. But imagine his shock, imagine his fear, when entirely apart from his own calculations, Sarai was taken from him and brought into the household of Pharaoh to be the Pharaoh's wife. Uh Uh-oh. And there really was no plan B. When we turn to our own devices, rather than obeying God's clear commands, we usually do so for the sake of something or some person we cherish. Yet when we are willing to abandon God to preserve that precious possession... When we follow our own course, it is precisely the precious possession that we will lose. Instead of gaining the world, we will lose both the world and ourselves. Abram lost his wife. And for all he knew, she was lost forever. What was he going to do? What could he say? I mean, he is one man, one family. Though be they be very large at this point with all the people that he had. What are they against the Pharaoh of Egypt? What are they against someone with such power and such great wealth? What are they against someone that has everything that you don't have? F.B. Meyer said the world may... Treat us well, but that will be poor compensation for our losses. There is no altar in Egypt. There is no fellowship with God. There are no new promises, but a desolated home and a wretched sense of wrong. When the prodigal leaves his father's house, though he may win a brief spell of forbidden pleasure... At the same time, he loses everything that makes life worth living. And he brings himself down to the level of the swine. In such a case, there is no recourse save to trace the way, trace back the way we have come. To do the first works, as John said in the Revelation. And like Abram, to go up out of Egypt to the place of the altar where he was at first. It is not unusual for a believer to head down into Egypt. But it is the place of great Loss. It is the place of self confidence. It is the place where we lose touch with the Lord. And usually a person does not even know it or realize it until the losses have begun to stack up. Well, here's Abram's sixth step back. It is the step. Of rebuke and humiliation. Now, fortunately, God does not normally permit his children to go their own way indefinitely, but he brings them back to their senses and to him. Some people think that when they walk away from God, They can walk away without any kind of recompense, whatever. I'll walk away from God. I'll stay away from God as long as I want. And God's not going to do one thing about it. Did you know that one of the evidences that a person is truly saved, that if they fall out of their relationship with the Lord, if they head down into Egypt, if they take on feelings of self-reliance and self-confidence, if they are trusting in their own wisdom, God is going to do something 
to bring that person back in line with his will and his work. Do you believe that? I believe it. I, I, I mean, look, listen, look at King David. Look at what Israel's King David got involved with. And did God say, okie dokie, I'll see you whenever you'd like to return? No. He went after David. You know, if we were to look at David's life, we would see that David had quit praying. We'd see that David had quit, had, had, was depending on his own wisdom. We'd see that David was not worshiping. It's the same thing that happened with Abram. But God sent Nathan after David. And of course, you know the story. David responded. God brought him back. But David came back in great humiliation and rebuke. Nevertheless, he came back. If you have been living life on your own, and God has not done something along the way to bring you back. What does that tell you? You don't belong to Him. You are not one of His children. God always works. Always to bring His children Back. And I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty cool. And God did that with Abram. And the fact that he brings us back to our senses and to him is a good thing. That's good news. But the fact that God often does so by exposing waywardness and bringing upon them rebuke and humiliation, well, that's the bad news. But it still brings a person back in line. Now, a person might be tempted to say that God intervened in the entire affair in Egypt for Sarai's sake. Since the diseases inflicted on Pharaoh kept him from profaning the one who was in his power through no direct fault of his own. But the intervention was not just for Sarai's sake, it was also for Abram's sake. What we see in Genesis chapter 12 is a pagan correcting a child of God. Is it not amazing that sometimes, sometimes people without God have a greater spiritual sensitivity than people with God? That sometimes people who do not know God have a greater sense of right and wrong than people who say they know God. And here's Abram, a man of faith. A man who took up the challenges of God, took off to a place he didn't even know where he was going. He packed up everything. And yet here he is, having just gotten out of the chute, being rebuked and humiliated by a pagan. Pharaoh summoned Abram, Pharaoh rebuked Abram, and then Pharaoh expelled Abram from Egypt. Did, did you see that in verses 18 and 19? Look at this. Then Pharaoh called and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say... She is my sister. So I took her for myself as a wife. Now then, here is your wife. And maybe, I don't know, in the way Egyptians say it, maybe he said, here is your stinking wife. Take her and go. I don't know how he said it. But here is an unbeliever. Showing greater remorse over this situation. Greater wisdom in this situation. 
greater action in this situation than the very man of God. Now, I have to say that as people of God, we are not perfect. Not. Say not with me. Not. We are not perfect. Would you give that testimony, Nancy, about Jeff? Is he, is he perfect? You didn't say that very loud. But I saw the shake. Yeah. Yeah, Judy, what, what about George? Is he perfect? No. <laughs> Boy, Judy, your voice has uh, gotten much lower since the last time we talked. And what about your husband, Donna? Is he perfect? <laughs> Did y'all see what she put up on Facebook the other day? What, what was it you said about husbands, that they are the biggest children that you'll ever have? And they constantly need correction? Is, is, that, is that what she said? Some of you saw it. And some of you put big old smiley faces on that. <laughs> We are not perfect, and sometimes we stumble, and guess what? Sometimes we stumble badly, but the worst thing that can happen in a sense is when an unbeliever has to correct us and bring us back in line. Wow. And that is precisely what happened with Abram. When Abram finally returned to Canaan. It does not say that the famine was over, does it? As far as we know, the famine was still ongoing. But Abram returns to Canaan, departed for Canaan, and it was a greatly subdued Abram. Now you would think that Abram had learned his lesson about all this. But down the road in Genesis, you know what we're going to see Abram doing? The same thing. And then do you know what we're going to see his son doing? The same thing. Now we'll talk about that when we get down the road. Someone has said it was not a pretty sight when Abram departed back for Canaan. But the effects of going our own way is never pretty. The good thing here is that Abram went back to Bethel. You remember what that word means? The house of God. That Abram went back to... Be and isn't it wonderful that God said, Abram, come on back. Isn't it wonderful that God said, you know, you didn't believe me. You didn't trust me. You used your own wisdom. You, you, fell, you fell out away from my relationship, but I, but I want you to come on back. You know, God always wants you to come back. And I think that's pretty wonderful. God is not the one who has trouble with us coming back. Who, who has trouble with us coming back? Us. Why? Because we simply cannot believe the grace of God, can we? We simply cannot truly believe that God wants us back. And yet Abram returns to Canaan, returns to the altar, returns to Bethel... And resumes his worship of God. Donald Ray Barnhouse comments on this incident by saying that like a coin that has a heads and a tail, every event in our lives can either draw us to God or push us away from God. If Abram had stayed in Canaan when the famine came, his faith would have grown. Why? What would have happened if he had stayed in Canaan? He would have seen God provide his needs, right? Sure. He would have seen God do the miraculous. But since he did not stay in Canaan, 
The same famine that could have been a means of spiritual growth actually took him away from God and eventually brought great humiliation. And don't you think a significant step in our relationship with God is to learn this particular lesson about life. Instead of complaining, we would trust God. Instead of saying, why has God allowed this to happen to me? Doesn't he care? Why has he abandoned me? We could say, now here is another opportunity for me to trust God. I wonder what wonderful things he is going to do for me this time. All right, now let's be honest. When is the last time some difficulty came into your life and you said to yourself and to the Lord, what great thing, God, are you going to do for me this time? Can, can you remember? I, I hope it was just yesterday. I, I hope maybe it was today. I, I, I hope it's been sometime this year. And see, this is the difference between us and the world. It is not that we have different problems as the world. Look, the whole world, or that part of the world, was, was subject to famine. We don't get exempted from problems that the world has like that. But it is how we respond to it. And when people see us responding to a difficulty with utter trust in God and the enthusiasm of expectation to see what wonderful thing God is going to do now, then you know what people do? They sit up and take notice. Because the same things that seem to destroy them actually lift up our Lives. Now, is holding you that kind of a posture easy? There's somebody calling in a response now. <laughs> Sometimes it takes more grace to stay in Canaan than it does to get to Canaan. But is that not what God wants? If he allowed our path to be easy always, then we would not grow. God arranges the steps of faith in an upward direction so that our spiritual muscles will become strong. And we can eventually scale the heights of great blessing. Now, I don't think anybody should wake up every day and say, boy, I can't wait to have a problem of the day. Whoop, you -hoo. I, I mean, have you ever awakened like that? Just can't wait. Well, we don't have to wish for that or say that or even pray for that because those things are going to come. They're just going to come. But... When they come and our faith stays strong in the Lord, though the world around us says, no, you've lost your mind. Those circumstances say, you got to be a realist. But we stay the course. And it is amazing how our strength in God grows. And how he uses us even more. Do, do you know what the first thing I do is when I've got a problem? What's the first thing you do? Uh, I'm going to pray. Okay, that, that's good. I, I think that's great. Or worship. That would be a good thing. That would be a good thing to do. Pray. I'm going to worship. I'm going to sing songs. I think that's always terrific. But Listen, if I find myself in difficulty, the first thing I want to do is find somebody else who's been in that same difficulty. 
I want to find somebody else who has found themselves bogged down with issues and problems. And I ask or request, tell me how you dealt with that. Tell me how you move forward through that. And of course, it's always a believer that you want to talk to. I have never gone to a person who's had no problems to help me solve problems. Have you? No. I mean, that, that would be like coming home with trigonometry homework and asking your kindergartner to solve it for you. That, that's not going to work. And as much as we may dislike this idea, it is true. When we face difficulty and we face difficulty trusting God for His mighty hand, we become a greater and greater testimony for God and actually God will cut our lives across the paths of others who are facing the same thing we face. Do you believe that? That's what Abraham had to learn. His story gets more and more exciting, but he was not perfect. Yet he came back. And so if you've been down to Egypt, just come back. God wants you to come back. Come back to the altar. Come back to the place of trust to the place of wisdom, to the place of relationship with God. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful to be in this place tonight, to be exposed to your word. It is a powerful word. It is a mighty word. It is a specific word. It is a wise word. It is a comforting word. It is a challenging word. It is a magnificent word. It is a ready word. And thank you for speaking to us tonight out of it. And for allowing Abram, who began so well, but then fell back, to be an example to us tonight. He started out, he fell back, but he came back. And I think that may be where some of us are. We started well, we fell back. Now it's time to come back. It's time to settle again at the altar. It's time to settle again at the place of worship. Time to return to Bethel, to the house of God. To the place of healing. To the place of usefulness. To the place of grace. And what we ask, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are worshiping...